Good morning to those of you in, here in person and those of you online. Welcome. Glad that we can be together to study God's Word. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving holiday, a peaceful one and a blessed one in some way. You know, the Thanksgiving holiday offers fabulous delights like turkey and pumpkin pie and time off from school and work, maybe time with family and friends. I hope you got to enjoy at least one of those blessings or something else that's special to you at Thanksgiving uh, this past uh, Thursday. But I think my favorite thing about Thanksgiving is how it directs our eyes back to God, right? Thanksgiving helps us to think about God and how from Him we receive every good thing. God provides us with food and water. He provides us with clothing. He provides us with everything we need for life every day. And it's good for us to take time to reflect on God's kindnesses to us and give Him thanks. Of course, once in a while, we might get a little distracted uh, from giving thanks to God. We might get a little frustrated with the way things are. Uh, my family is uh, sort of in the market for a new used car right now. We need to replace an aging vehicle, and I've got my eyes on one certain model that I would uh, like to, to buy that I think would be a good fit for our family. And 18 months ago, it was easily within our price range. But as you may have heard, car prices have shot through the roof, and that car is not in our price range anymore. A Consumer Reports article last month said used car prices are up 42% compared to just before the pandemic. Can you believe it? 42%. Which is great if you want to sell a car. Now might be the time. But it's not so great if you need to buy a car. In fact, we are experiencing inflation nationwide. It's been all over the news the last few months. 6.2% inflation from October last year to October this year. We haven't seen inflation like this since the early 90s, for those of you old enough to remember back that far. And really, I mean, we haven't seen serious inflation maybe like this since the 1970s, if you can remember back that far. Those of you who had turkey for Thanksgiving... Did the price of turkey seem a little higher this year than, than last year? They say it went up a little bit. USA Today reported on November 11th that at that time, turkey prices were up about 10% over last year. So I guess you call that turkeyflation. All this inflation, they say, I'm not an economist, just go with what I hear. They say it's caused by an overwhelmed global supply chain that has bottlenecks in certain spots, keeping things from moving around, and so they get more expensive, and shipping is more expensive right now. And they say it's caused by a global semiconductor shortage, so anything that uses advanced electronics is just kind of slowed down and stuck. It makes the prices go up. And there's a national worker shortage. We don't have as many workers as our companies want to have. And so prices go up because you have to pay them more. And then there are probably some other factors beyond my understanding involved as well. And it's kind of scary. You put all this together, it's a little scary not knowing, are we going to be able to afford a turkey next year? Uh, how high might prices go? What if inflation continues? What if it accelerates? What if prices get so high that we can't afford the things that we need? And so we worry over all the bad economic news in the media. And you know what people do when they're worried about getting the things they need, right? You've experienced it. Remember the toilet paper shortage last year? What did people do when they were afraid they weren't going to get toilet paper? They grabbed what they could in huge you know, packages of it, took it home and, and hoarded it, right? When we're afraid, we get greedy. There was plenty of toilet paper in the country last year. There was plenty, as long as people bought what they needed and didn't hoard. But the fear of not having enough is a very real fear. Most of us have plenty. We live in a wealthy country. But sometimes, even so, we might struggle a little bit and have this nagging voice in the back of our minds that asks us, what if? What if? Yes, I have plenty today, but what if? What if the pandemic gets worse? What if the old car breaks down and car prices are still super high and we can't afford a new one? 
What if, you remember Venezuela? Back in the 1980s, early 80s, Venezuela was the uh, most prosperous country in South America, in, in Latin America. They were, they were a wealthy country. They have incredible oil reserves. And they were selling oil and making a huge profit. And they, they were doing great. But then heavy corruption combined with dropping oil prices ruined their economy. In 2013, get this, their annual inflation rate was 40%. Prices went up 40% in one year. In 2016, it was 254%. What if that were to happen here? We're so dependent on the basic things we need to survive, food, water, clothes, shelter, that it's hard to not be scared uh, sorry, it's not hard to be scared when we start worrying about what if. And it's happened elsewhere. So it's, it's not unrealistic to say, what if it happened here? The best thing about Thanksgiving, I think, is how it turns our eyes back to God. It's hard to be super worried when your eyes are fixed on God. I think it's always good to listen to Jesus. Um, when we hear voices in the media or among friends, relatives, whatever, talking about this and that, sometimes we get all caught up and, and uh, concerned and frustrated and upset. And it's always good to, for us to go back and listen to Jesus. And Jesus talked about money concerns one day as he was teaching. He talked about money, but really the thrust of his message had to do more with how we think about God. And so let's take a minute and let's listen to what Jesus said. And let's begin in Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be 
also. Jesus talks about money concerns here. And he hits two very different uh, topics under that heading, both of which are, I think, really two sides of the same problem. First, he warns us about greed, our desire to have more than we need. And then he addresses our fear of not having what we do need. So first, he encounters this man in the crowd who calls out to him to step in and make his brother divide the inheritance with him as he should. And Jesus just immediately declines to get into the mess of who's right, who's wrong in this situation. How much should each brother receive? Why can't these two brothers get along? Maybe you've seen situations like this. I hope not. It's always a shame when families fight over the inheritance when a loved one has passed away. One would hope their relationships would be more important to them than the money was. But Jesus senses a deeper problem here than one brother being unfair to the other. He senses greed. And so he warns the people, be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in in an abundance of possessions. Life is not about getting stuff. And having wealth is not the secret to a fulfilling life. Then Jesus tells this story about a farmer who harvested his best crop ever, had to decide what to do with it, and decided to store the surplus, live off the bounty it provided, and retire early. Luxury was his. Take life easy, he told himself. Eat, drink, and be merry. And so began for him the good life. Until that night... When God declared, You're, you fool, you're done, and the man died, his good life lasted, um, let's say, 12 hours-ish. Everything he had gained for himself was lost. And Jesus' lesson in this parable is, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. This is what will happen to everyone who pursues earthly riches and not heavenly riches. One day, everything they've lived for will suddenly be gone. One writer summed up this wealthy farmer's mistake succinctly. He said the man did two things wrong. First, he never saw beyond himself. Everything was about him and his own comfort He never thought to help anyone else with all the surplus God had given him. He never thought to lower his prices so the poor could buy more food to sustain their families. He never saw beyond himself. And then he never saw beyond this world. He wasn't thinking about what comes after your life on this earth is done. And so when it was time to leave this world and stand before God, he was not prepared. He never saw beyond this world. This is the story of a man who had plenty but failed to turn his eyes toward God. And so the things that he ran after in life were not the things of God, but things that he thought would bring him pleasure. His story would have ended quite differently if he had kept his eyes on God, if he had worked to be rich toward God. He would have had a good ending to his story. And then without stopping, Jesus shifts into a a second teaching here. Having warned us about greed, our desire to have more than we need, he now addresses our fear of not having the things we do need. Now those sound like opposite problems, but I'm going to suggest to you that they grow up out of the same root. Jesus moves from don't be greedy to don't worry. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat. Don't worry about your body, what you will wear. And just like he told the crowd, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So now he says, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. These things are not what life is about. In fact, Jesus says, consider the ravens, big Black birds like oversized crows. 
You don't see them much here in the city, but just go a little bit out of town and, uh, and you see them out in the country. We see them frequently around our house. In fact, I saw some uh, at our house yesterday flying by. Ravens, Jesus says, don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. They don't go hungry. And you are much more valuable to God than birds are. Not that God doesn't value the birds. He does. He created the birds. He's very pleased with the birds. But birds are not created in his image. We were created to be God's children, made in his image. And we're God's children in a way that the birds are not. And so if God takes care of the birds, why would we ever think that he would not also take care of us? Besides, as Jesus points out, you can't extend your life by worrying. Worrying's not going to make you live longer. Being fraught with worry is just not a good way to live. It doesn't help us live longer or better. Again, Jesus says, consider how the wildflowers grow. And we live in a great place for this analogy uh, because we have wonderful wildflowers on the hillsides in the springtime. Sometimes you can see them. They'll be yellow, sometimes pink or blue or purple. Uh, you get up in the hills and walk uh, along the trails up in the hills and you see wildflowers all over around your feet in about oh, late March, April, early May. And they're just gorgeous. But then by the end of May, you don't get out there in time. If you wait till it gets warm outside, you get out there on the hillside and the, most of the flowers are gone. When the sun comes out and gets hot, when that hot wind blows, those uh, flowers dry up. The green grass on the hillsides dries up and turns brown. And it's similar in Israel. The flowers bloom and the grass grows when there's rain. And then when it gets hot, the grass dries up, the flowers wither. And then it's just good. You know, that grass is only good for gathering it up and using it for fuel for your fire. Jesus says, God clothes the grass of the field more richly than Israel's richest king ever, King Solomon, even though the grass is here today and gone tomorrow. And he says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And you hear Jesus prompting us to have more faith in God. You of little faith, grow in your faith. Because the root problem behind our worry about economics, finances, money, whether we'll have the things we need, is simply this. We take our eyes off of God. It's the same issue as the issue that lies at the root of greed. Take your eyes off God and you either become oriented around pleasing yourself, you become greedy, or you start to be overcome with worry because you can never know if you'll have what you need tomorrow. And so Jesus teaches us to set our eyes on God and to run after the things of his kingdom. And not to worry about the little things that God has promised to take care of for his children. Jesus says in verse 29, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. First, Jesus says, Don't worry about the daily necessities of life. The pagan world, that's people who don't know God, who don't follow the Lord, they run after all such things. This is what they live for, getting more stuff, trying to get enough to feel secure, or to live in luxury like that farmer did in Jesus' parable. Just turn on the TV and watch a, a few commercials and you see this all over the place. The, the commercials will tell you there's always something else that you desperately need. And if you had it, then you would be happy. And then listen to the news and hear all the latest about inflation and the worker shortage, problems in the global supply chain. How will anyone survive? But Jesus says, your father knows that you need all these things. He knows what you need to survive. And he's your father. Your good father, good fathers provide for their children. And God will provide for you. Seek his kingdom, Jesus says. 
and these things will be given to you as well. They will all be yours. Not because you worried so much, not because you're such an amazing farmer and grew this fantastic crop, but because your Father will provide for you when you need, as you run after his kingdom. Not run after the things of this world like so many people do, but the things of God, the things that are important to him. And so if Jesus is right, then God's children don't have to worry about having what they need to survive. God will provide what we need. I may or may not be able to get the specific car I'm aiming for, the one I have my eyes set on, but if my family needs a car, God will provide one. And I don't have to worry. What he provides, even if it's not my first choice, it'll be sufficient. It'll be what we need. And if the worst happens, and the economy collapses, and inflation skyrockets, and toilet paper's in short supply again, what will we do then? We, (laughs) yes, brother, that's right. I won't repeat that. (laughs) We will, that's a good example of we will discover that we can live on less than we thought we could live on. That we actually need less than, than what we maybe thought And God will still provide what we really do need. And we will will not be uh, uh, abandoned by God. Our brothers and sisters in Christ in Venezuela are going through a very hard time. God help them. Man, they've been in a tough spot for many years now. And it hasn't gotten better yet that I've heard about. Uh, Jenny and I have... uh, a couple in the, in the church, faithful missionary couple that lived in Venezuela for a little while, just recently moved to another country. Um, and they would tell about how the church there in Venezuela is suffering, but they're surviving. And God provides for them every day. And the believers are helping each other day by day. That's one of the ways that God provides for his people is through his other people as we, we help one another. And if the worst happened here, yes, we would be a lot poorer No, we would not like that very much. But we would still be rich in the most important ways, in the things that really matter in God's kingdom, because we would have God. And in the end, that's all that matters. And so we don't worry, because our eyes are fixed on God. We do not run after food or drink or clothes or economic security or the pleasures of life. God provides what we need And so we run after the things of his kingdom. As long as we keep our eyes on our good father, we have no need to either be greedy, because we know that God will provide everything we need and more, or worried, because we know that God will provide everything we need and more. So bad economic news doesn't panic us, because God will provide And even the most skillfully crafted advertisements cannot persuade us because God himself provides for us and we are content. This lesson series is about fear. What it means to fear God. How to deal with our fear of genuinely scary things in life like from last week our fear of sin and today our fear of not having enough. Jesus here has made a case for his followers to invest themselves in the discipline of looking to God for help and abstaining from the temptation to fear not having enough. In fact, he actually says in verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock. He actually says, do not be afraid. Don't fear. Why? Because God has been, God your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Everything that is involved in our Father's care of His people is yours. God Himself will make sure that you have what you need both now and eternally. And so, having faith that God will provide what we need, we can join with God in providing for others. So Jesus says in verse 33, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail. Give to the poor. Store up treasure, not on earth, 
but in heaven. We can be generous because we know God provides for us. And like God did for that rich farmer in Jesus' story, though the farmer tragically never realized it, God often provides for us so that we will have the means to then provide for others. This past week, the Christian Chronicle, uh, Church of Christ newspaper uh, based out of Oklahoma, they posted an article online called, What If It Were Me? Churches of humble means in southern Africa experience the power of generosity as they serve the displaced. The article tells about how very poor believers in our sister church in Montepuez, Mozambique, are giving generously to help provide basic food and supplies for refugees fleeing violence in the northern part of their country. People who have had to leave everything behind and have therefore become even poorer than the people in in this church themselves are. These are people who have almost nothing and yet have their eyes fixed on our good Father and who are therefore seeking and running after the things of His kingdom and who therefore believe they can help others because God helps them. They can't afford much, but they're giving what they can. And some churches here in the States Uh, are helping them, which has boosted their ability uh, to give to the poorest in their nation. If you believe God will provide for you, then you can be generous and help someone else who has even less than you have. All it takes is for us to keep our eyes on God. God who so richly clothes the wildflowers. Remember that next spring when the hills green up and the flowers come out? Remember how God clothes the wildflowers. God who provides food for the ravens. Remember that next time you see a raven or even a crow flying around and they're not sowing or planting or or, that's the same thing, or building a barn, God provides food for the ravens. The best thing about Thanksgiving, I think, is how it turns our eyes back to God. It's hard to be super worried when your eyes are fixed on God. So pay attention to all that economic news. It is important. It's important for us to know how things are going in the community around us, in the world around us. That's important. Manage your finances wisely. That's just being a good steward of what God has given you. But don't ever be greedy, of course. We honor God when we are content with what he provides for us. We know that if we need anything more, He will provide that too. And do not be afraid. God gives us his eternal kingdom. He will also give us everything we need. So seek his kingdom and run after it and rest in him and help those who are in need. All of this honors God. It's part of how we fear him. And give thanks. Thanksgiving is a wonderful holiday. It's an even better spiritual discipline for us to practice every day. Give thanks to God. It keeps our eyes focused on God and helps us to not be afraid. May God bless you today. Let's pray. We honor you, Lord our God, for being our good Father who always provides for his children. We thank you, dear God, for providing us with uh, food and drink, with clothing and shelter, and so many more things than what we actually need. We thank you for the wealth of our nation. We do not take that for granted. We thank you for um, our ability to live in a society where most people don't have to worry about having enough food every day. Yet we understand, Lord, that there are some, even in our society and even in our uh, city, in our county, who do not have enough food, and we pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts that are sensitive to them. Lord, teach us to so fix our eyes on you and so run after your kingdom that uh, in confidence, the confidence of knowing that you will provide for us, we uh, will then be free to provide for others. Give us generous hearts. For you have been so generous to us. Take away our fear, Lord. We, we live in uncertain times because of the pandemic primarily, but also because of all the other troubles of life. 
And they weigh us down sometimes, Lord, and we get distracted and frustrated. But fix our eyes on you, oh God, and help us to walk in your ways and seek your kingdom. Thank you for Jesus who did this better than anyone else and who modeled for us how to fix our eyes on you. Dear God, guide us and bless us this week. Help us to be generous to those in need who you bring our way. Give us wisdom about when to help and how to help. Help us to do so in in ways that are healthy and good. Um, Most of all, Lord, help us to honor you by all that we do. Bless your church this week, Lord. Bless us, each one of us. Bless our sister churches in Venezuela and in Mozambique. Bless them as they serve uh, one another and the very poor there. And bless us here as well. In Jesus' name, amen.